Hi everyone, you may have seen this guide floating around on the internet titled Introduction to NAS Translution 200. Uh, in this video, I want to go slide by slide and explain the concepts behind optimization in and NAS Translution 200. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, feedback, uh, feel free to send me an email at this email address that you see at the bottom of the slide or you can leave me a comment in the video description below. Now, it's my hope that by the end of this video or after going through the guide, you have a fundamental understanding of what optimization is. And once you have this fundamental uh, knowledge, you can go ahead and find a structure to automatically optimize with NAS Translution 200. Uh, I'll glance over this and just go on to the next uh, slide. What is optimization? Uh, to start off with, let's suppose we have a very simple mathematical example. Here I have a function plotted as f equals x1 squared plus x2 squared. And then we are at a starting or initial point 3 comma 4. If we were to ask NAS Translution 200, find the minima of this function. Here in orange is what the actual result NAS Tran produced during the optimization. So when you see this, this is what optimization is. It's the process of finding a minima or a maxima for a given function. Now let's suppose we introduce a so-called constraint. Here I have a new constraint saying g1 given by this ex expression is greater than one. So what this means is that anything outside of this ellipsoid is the so-called feasible region. Any design outside of the ellipsoid is valid for the constraint. Anything within the ellipsoid is invalid, and this is the infeasible region. Here, if we look at what Nastran does, if we were to include this constraint, we see that Nastran actually goes towards the minimum, but actually finds or encounters the design constraint. Here, if we look at the overview of this graph, we see the optimizer goes towards the global minimum, but once it encounters the constraint, it moves along the ellipsoid or the constraint. Uh, the reason it moves along the ellipsoid is because once it hits the constraint, there is still an opportunity to minimize the constraint, as you see here. So it can still minimize the objective function that you see here. One thing that's very critical for optimization is defining your problem statement. Uh, this is composed of three things. One, your design variables, two, your design objective, and three, your design constraints. Design variables. What variables in your function are you letting vary? In this example, I'm letting variables x1 and x2 vary. Your objective. What's your objective function? Here, I have it explicitly written out. It's this function given by x1 squared plus x2 squared and your design constraints. Uh, what are your inequalities that you have um, that give you a restriction as to what design models or variables are, uh, can fulfill the design? So again, these three things are very critical for optimization. Definitely have these written out before you uh, set off and performing an optimization of your own. And now let's go ahead and discuss size optimization. There are a lot of optimization types around um, here and for the remainder of the guide I'll be talking about size optimization and now I'll take time to describe what size optimization is. Here I have a built-up structure on first glance, it doesn't look too significant. Uh, if you separate the elements, we find out that we have two dimensional elements here in yellow and one dimensional elements represented by these green lines here as you see with the mouse or the laser pointer. 
once we assign parameters to these elements, for example, a thickness to the two-dimensional elements, we assign parameters for the beam cross-section of the windy elements, that's when the structure is uh, fully defined with parameters, I should say. And here is just the restatement of uh, what I just said. So that's what size optimization is. It's the process of taking one of these parameters and setting it as a design variable. I can set the thickness as design ver variable x1. I can set dimension 1 as design variable x2, and so on and so on. That's what size optimization is. And there are different flavors of optimization. There's topology optimization, where the optimizer would decide which uh, pieces of material to remove from your model. There's shape optimization, where the optimizer will, if a boundary is defined, will vary the boundary or the profile of the model and find an optimal configuration. There's also topometry optimization that's an element by element type of optimization. And then there's topography optimization that allows you to move elements normal to a given plane. And for the remainder of the guide, I'll be focusing on size optimization. So just to give you some examples on NAS Translution 200, here is a cantilever tube or cylinder, if you will. Uh, the two dimensional elements are composed of a composite laminate that you see here in the layout. Uh, there's an internal pressure. Our design or optimization problem statement is defined as follows. We want to let the thickness of the plies vary. We want to let the orientation angles of the plies also vary. Uh, we want to minimize the mass or the weight, and we also want to constrain the strength ratio of each ply to be within 0.9. Here we see what the optimizer has done. It started off with a weight of 1.6 and it ultimately landed at a weight of approximately, I'll round up to 0.4. Here is a history of the orientation angles for the different plies. So we started at, we started off at a little bit over 80 degrees or 85 degrees and 60 degrees. And by the end we have approximately 45 degrees, zero degrees, and negative 45 degrees here. We also have an example of a model matching um, scenario. In these situations, you might have a finite element model, and then you might have a separate experimental model. Both models produce quantities such as displacements, stresses. In this example, we perform a normal mode, so we're given mode shapes. NAS Translution 200 can be used to modify your parameters so your simulation FE model better matches your experimental results. As an example, here in orange is the first bending mode for the FE model. Here in blue are results from the experiment and you can see we're kind of off from matching experimental results. So when we use NAS Translation 200 to vary some of the parameters uh, and so on and so on. Here in gray is the final or optimized mode shape. Here in gray you can see it lines up to the experimental points indicating that our FE model better matches the experiment. So again this is a model matching uh, example. There are other terms used to refer to this system identification and correlation to experiment. And the next example, uh, buckling, very significant thing if you are in the aerospace sector. Here, NAS Translution 200 was used to vary some of the parameters in this model. We wanted to make sure that one, buckling was precluded. We want to avoid buckling at all costs. Also, we wanted to make sure that the stresses and the various members were within the limits. So... Here, you can take time to refer to the guidebook, which goes into more detail regarding what the variables were, the objectives, the constraints, and even the optimization results. And here's a quick result of the optimization. And now, how to set up NAS Translution 200. Uh, 
here I won't go step by step. Uh, this is more of a tutorial you can have on your own and go at your own pace. One thing I will go over is the Natran Solution 200 web app. This web app will allow you to take uh, an existing BDF file. It could also be a DAT file. It could be a Solution 101, a 103, a 105. Um, that would have been the statics, uh, normal modes, buckling analysis types. Uh, you can optimize for dynamics too. The web app will let you convert your Solution 100 file to Nashtran Solution 200. It's going to help you create your design variables, your objective, and your constraints. Typically, if you were to do this on your own, you would probably have to write out these statements by hand. Your DESVAR entry has to be written out or typed out. Your DRS1 has to be typed out. Um, you have to spend hours in documentation trying to understand what's going on with all of these statements. With the web app, you don't have to do that. You can use the web app to, again, create all of this for you and ultimately perform your optimization in a short amount of time. And here, again, feel free to refer to this. I go step by step how to use the web app. Uh, this example is a fairly easy example. It can be done in less than 10 minutes, which is a big contrast to the 30, 40, 50 minutes it would take you with other methods. And then just in case you're new to NAS Translation 200 and you want additional resources, uh, this guidebook has a link to dozens of YouTube tutorials. Uh, if you want access to the web app, feel free to email me. If you want free live training, I'd be more than glad to help you with that. If you want a guidance from an expert, um, I'm definitely here to support you. So again, you can email me. My email is here in the bottom. And then there's one very useful document. This is where I learned a lot of my optimization knowledge. The NAS Trend Design Sensitivity and Optimization User's Guide. Uh, this is definitely the container of everything for NAS Trend Solution 200. So I recommend this as a reference. And then final comments. Um, I definitely hope that you are moving one step closer to automatically optimizing structures. This is a very special capability and very powerful within Nastran. Uh, again, if you have any questions, comments, if you want guidance, training on Nastran optimization, you can send me an email here and I'll definitely get back to you. And just to leave you off with one last simple optimization example, I have this new function that you see here in purple defined by F. We are going to see what Nastran or an optimizer would do if we start off at three different initial points. The way the optimizer works is via a gradient method. It's essentially computing partial derivatives and its first step is to go up the steepest direction. And this is very significant because for this example, you can see how different the slopes are at the starting points. At this initial point, the slope is pointing in the rightward direction. So during the optimiza optimization, it goes in this upward direction, ultimately ending up at this optimum given by this uh, orange design constraint. Here in purple is another scenario where we start off at a different initial point. The partial derivative is in a different direction. Hence, the path or the optimization path goes in the other direction and a new optimum is found. And here, a third a point where we start, and you can see it lands at this so-called local maximum. Uh, so this is the last interesting optimization example I wanted to leave you off with. Uh, at this point, uh, feel free to pause the video and uh, go optimize the structure. Um, if you're interested, you can stick around and see this bonus section on sensitivity analysis. So what is sensitivity analysis? It's the process of computing a partial derivative uh, for a model. So let's suppose you want to minimize the weight of your structure. What parameters should you select to optimize? You can perform a sensitivity analysis and reveal which design variables have the highest uh, derivatives, if you will. 
those with the highest derivatives are indicative of having a high uh, impact on the weight. So those would be a good place to start when it comes to optimizing for weight as an example. Here, let's start off with something very simple. Uh, this example I showed earlier in the presentation, uh, F, G, G2. I've taken time to compute these partial derivatives by hand, and we are going to use these to confirm the sensitivities or the partial derivatives computed by Nash Trans Solution 200. Here's an example of the output you might find in the F06 file. On first glance, uh, it may be a little complicated to the read, but here I have in red um, in some functions uh, descriptions of what these various values mean. In this first left hand column, we have the values of the actual responses. Uh, here, Nastrum reports a value of 2.5 to the 1 here. This is the value of f evaluated at the original point. So this would be 25. This would be the value of g1 reported at 3,4, 13, and so on and so on. Here, further on the right, is where we have the values of the partial derivatives or sensitivities actually computed for me. Here, the first partial of f with respect to x1 is 6, and Nastrum reports the same value. Here to the right is the partial of f with respect to x2, and you can see it matches the 8 from Nastrum. So again, the partial derivatives are the sensitivities. There are various types of sensitivities out there. There are absolute sensitivities, normalized sensitivities, and normalized relative sensitivities. Absolute sensitivities are just partial derivatives where you take, or rather, uh, Nastran performs the sensitivity calculation in a certain way. Uh, here, it it doesn't it doesn't always compute the sensitivity analytically. Uh, sometimes it might use its own special method where it has to use a certain step size to compute the sensitivity. Uh, so here, just to be brief with this, I have expressions to define what these various types of sensitivities are. Feel free to pause the video or refer to the guidebook to really digest what these various sensitivities are. So with that, um, that's the end of the guidebook. Again, if you want any guidance training on a present or optimization example of your own uh, feel free to send me an email if you want access to the national solution 200 web app i can definitely work with you on that uh, with that a big thank you for everyone who saw my video today and i look forward to having you see my future videos thank you